What's up, everybody? Welcome to the FanDuel Hurry Up. I am Frank Stample, joined by Jim Sonis of Number Fire to bring you some bold predictions for the 2019 fantasy football season. What's going on, Jim? I am excited for week one. It's just around the corner. Preseason was fun. I, I really did enjoy preseason, but to have actual football in week one, have actual data to work with after week one, it doesn't get a whole lot better than that. So I am beyond excited. How are you doing, Frank? Same, man. Super excited for week one just around the corner here. A lot of fantasy football drafts still going on over the weekend. So we're going to give people some bold predictions for the upcoming season. And the first one that you have, Jim, is revolving around Lamar Jackson, a very polarizing quarterback this year. What do you have on Lamar Jackson? Yeah, I think at the end of the year, we'll be talking about Lamar Jackson being a top five quarterback for fantasy. And for fantasy is key there because I don't know what Lamar Jackson will do as a pass. So that's a complete mystery to me, but he doesn't have to be super accurate to be a good fantasy quarterback and even be a good real world quarterback because Lamar Jackson is such a threat with his legs. He opens up additional room as a passer as well. That's beneficial to him. He doesn't have to be as accurate. That's good for him. They also added to their pass catchers this year in the draft pretty heavily. So I like the weapons around Lamar Jackson. I think that's very good. Even with him being thrown to this offense midseason last year, where the offense was not really tailored around him yet, he still went out there and showed that he has just a massive floor for fantasy. He scored at least 16 fantasy points in every game that he started. He had more than 20 points twice, and now you give him a full offseason for them to build this Ravens offense around him, and I, I expect really good things for him in fantasy in 2019. I think there's kind of just this blob at quarterback once you get past those top-end guys, and I think that Jackson is firmly within that second tier, and anybody in that second tier can be a top-five quarterback, and I think that Jackson given the floor he has for rushing and the upside he could have if he, if he can do anything as a passer is really good. So Lamar Jackson, someone I'm getting pretty much everywhere. I know that his, his cost has gone up as the summer has gone along, but I am still buying him where he's going. I think that the upside and the floor are way too good for me to pass up. Lamar Jackson is a cheat code for fantasy football this upcoming season because of his rushing ability. Also working with offensive coordinator Greg Roman, who has worked with similar quarterbacks in the past. Jim Sonnet says Lamar Jackson, a top five quarterback this upcoming season. Let's move over to the running back position. And honestly, Jim, this one has me pumped up because I have a ton of shares of Aaron Jones already in fantasy football. What do you have regarding Aaron Jones this season? Yeah, I feel like whenever I have a late third round pick and Aaron Jones falls to me, it's always like this little celebration, like he shouldn't be there. I would consider taking him in the second round if I had to, but I don't have to right now because he's just so cheap. And I think that with Aaron Jones, I think he's going to return first round value, which is why I'm so excited to get him in the late third round, which I can at times get him for this year. And I think there are a couple of things you want to look for in trying to identify running backs who can return first round value. You want guys who are going to get a lot of rushes, a lot of targets, and a lot of touchdowns. And Aaron Jones is a candidate to have all three of those things. He averaged 5.3 targets per game last year when he was in his bell cow type role, which is the role I expect him to be in at the start of 2019. Matt LaFleur, their new head coach, has also mentioned how much he wants to get his running backs work in the passing game. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And it's also good to hear for a guy like Aaron Jones, who has shown he is capable as a receiver as well. And an offense led by Aaron Rodgers is always going to be a threat to score a lot of touchdowns. Add in that their offensive line has extra depth this year, and they're also really good among the starters. And Aaron Jones has everything that you want for a guy to be a first-round running back. You don't have to take him there. You don't have to by any means, but I think that that's really the upside for Aaron Jones. And I would not be shocked if we're coming back here in 2020 and talking about how Aaron Jones is a good first round pick in the mid to late part of that. So Aaron Jones, if you can get him in the third round, I would take him every single time. But even if the draft car cost, it seems a little bit higher than that. I'd be willing to take him at the end of the second because this guy's upside is just so good. Aaron Jones has averaged 5.5 yards per carry in his career. Matt LaFleur wants to run the football more this year as well with the Green Bay Packers. A lot of the times in fantasy sports, we're trying to find that third-round pick that can return first-round value. Jim Sonnes thinks Aaron Jones is that player. Let's stick with the running back position here and a little bit more doom and gloom this time when it comes to Joe Mixon and the Cincinnati Bengals. Jim, what do you have regarding Joe Mixon this season? 
Yeah, it's not a bold take to say that Joe Mixon will fall short of expectations, but it's kind of worded vaguely intentionally because I like the volume for Joe Mixon. I think that's super encouraging, but the ceiling is is very scary, and this team is very scary right now because you look at injuries in the NFL. They're going to happen every time, and an injury that occurs in September or October is going to be a red flag. But injuries that happen in July, those are even bigger red flags. And the Bengals had several of those. They had their left tackle uh, have shoulder surgery. He's likely done for the year. Then they moved their left guard out to left tackle, back out to left tackle as he was there last year. And the guy who could have potentially replaced that guy at left guard decided to retire. They have since had a second retirement on the offensive line. A.J. Green went down, which hurts this team's offensive efficiency. And the Bengals are in a pretty scary spot where they could wind up being a pretty dysfunctional team, even with Andy Dalton and Joe Mixon and Tyler Boyd being fully healthy. That is a pretty major concern for me that this offense could just fail to function. And that's a concern for Joe Mixon. We have not seen him be this bell cow running back who gets a lot of carries and a lot of targets outside of basically the second half of last year. So I'm concerned. We talk about Aaron Jones checking all three boxes potentially for this year. And Joe Mixon checks the volume box and he checks maybe the target box, but I'm scared about this offense. So I think that his cost has come down. He's now going off the board in the middle of the second round. That's not egregious, but I'm not going to take him there. When there are guys like Dalvin Cook, Aaron Jones, Leonard Fournette, Devontae Freeman still available, I'm scared of this offense and it makes me pretty wary of Joe Mixon. And I would not be shocked if he fell, if he falls well short of expectations. Yeah, this one hurts, Jim, and it's hard to blame you, really, because of everything that's happened with the Cincinnati Bengals. Injuries to their offensive line, retirements to their offensive line, A.J. Green going down with injury. I think Joe Mixon is a really, really talented player, but could be in for a really, really tough season with the Cincinnati Bengals in 2019. Let's move over to wide receiver and our J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. <laughs> we saw Robbie Anderson take off in the final month of the season. You think that that's going to carry over into this season, Jim? Yeah, I think Robbie Anderson has a good chance to be a high-end wide receiver, too. And based on where he's going in ADP as wide receiver 29, that would be outperforming his ADP by quite a bit. And you could be concerned about Robbie Anderson because they did bring in Jamison Crowder, Le'Veon Bell is there, Quincy Inunua is healthy, and Chris Herndon will be back after his four-game suspension. But I think that the way you want to think about this Jets team, based on the way they've been operating in the preseason, is... Kind of like the Rams. I'm not saying they'll be the Rams. I'm saying that they're similar to them in a lot of ways, specifically in that they're going to run a lot of three wide receiver sets. Adam Gase has wanted to do this in the past. He has done so in the preseason with the Jets. And what that means is it's probably going to lead to a relatively narrow target tree where Le'Veon Bell will get his, as will Crowder and Inunua. But there's still the possibility that Robbie Anderson is getting, you know, upwards of 20% of the targets. And that's valuable when it's a guy who is as good as he is but also who gets the variety of targets that Anderson gets. Because Robbie Anderson, among the guys in this team, he's pretty obviously the best deep threat that they've got. And Sam Darnold, despite the reputation that he had at the beginning of last year, he does like to throw deep. 20% of Sam Darnold's attempts last year went at least 15 or 16 yards beyond the line of scrimmage. That ranked 10th in the NFL out of 41 qualified passers. So you may think of Sam Darnold as a guy who likes to throw short, but last year... That was not the case. He did go deep pretty often, and it's almost always going to be Robbie Anderson who's getting those targets. And those are high-value targets, and I want to get as many of those as I can possibly get. The Jets have been running up tempo during the preseason, too, so concerns around pace may be still there, but not as big as they were. And if they decide to operate as a mid-level team in pace, like if they rank 16th in situation-neutral pace, Robbie Anderson's upside is pretty good. So... I understand the concerns around Adam Gase's reputation as a play caller and the conservative nature of their pace. I understand the concerns about added targets, but Robbie Anderson is going to get the targets that we want. And this team, I think, could outperform expectations. So Robbie Anderson's a guy I am targeting pretty heavily in the sixth round. I think he makes a lot of sense, and I would not be shocked if he winds up being around the wide receiver 15 at the end of the season. Robbie Anderson, a super talented wide receiver. I think he proved that last year. But, Jim, I have to ask you, any concern over this mild calf strain he's dealing with? Yeah, we were talking about with the Bengals, where concerns in, you know, injuries in September make sense, but injuries in, in August and July are, are pretty concerning. So it's something to keep an eye on for sure. But 
at least based on what we've seen so far from Anderson, I am not flashing up the, you know, the warning signs yet. The problem is we're not going to get any clarity on him until probably Wednesday when that first practice report comes out. So I think it's one of those weekends where we just keep Roto World up and keep on refreshing it and see if we get any, any information. But at least based on what we've seen right now, I feel pretty okay with it. But yeah, Frank, it's something we're going to have to monitor for sure throughout the weekend. Pay attention to the minor groin injury when it comes to Robbie Anderson, but there's no doubting how talented he is. He proved that over the final month of the season last year and already has a really good rapport with Sam Darnold. Let's stick with the wide receiver position, and this time it's MVS. Shout out to my ECW Rob Van Dam fans out there, but Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Jim, a lot of people have been trying to figure out whether to take Marquez Valdez-Scantling or Geronimo Allison. It seems like you are very clearly taking Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Yeah, to be fully up front, I'm okay with both. I will take either. Uh, you know, if I don't get MVS, I will happily take Geronimo Allison. But I like the upside that MVS has a little bit more. So if I can choose between the two, I will go MVS. But if I don't get him, then I'll take Geronimo Allison too. Because I just want exposure to offenses led by Aaron Rodgers, as we discussed with Aaron Jones. And one thing I think that can be helpful when trying to identify players you want to draft for this year is ask yourself, all right, who is going lower right now than where they'll go in 2020? You're trying to buy them before the cost goes up. And I think with Marquez Valdez-Scantling, we could see him be a top five round pick next year if things go the way they could. And that's my bold prediction is that next year we'll see MVS go within the first five rounds because he's tied to Aaron Rodgers. We love that. And he's also looking like he'll be on the field in two wide receiver sets whereas Geronimo Allison may not. So they decide to go with heavy personnel. We'll still see MVS out there, whereas Geronimo Allison may not. It also helps that Marquez Valdez-Scanling is a big player who ran a really fast time at the Combine. And when you can get that size and speed combination, it's pretty attractive from an upside perspective. We saw MVS flash some of that last year when he got chances. Now it seems like he will get a chance for the full season with the healthy Aaron Rodgers, with a new offense in place, I think those things are all pretty enticing from an upside perspective. So MVS going in the ninth round right now, I don't think that will last into 2020. So I think that if you want to get MVS shares while he's still cheap, do it in 2019, get him in your best ball drafts, get him in redraft as well, and maybe buy him in Dynasty because I don't think the cost for Marquez Valdez-Scantling is going down anytime soon. Marquez Valdez Scantling, aka MVS, just a physical freak, six foot four, four point three seven forty. Lot to be excited about this upcoming season with the Green Bay Packers. Last but not least, we have a tight end. It's Austin Hooper and Jim. You have a pretty bold prediction when it comes to Austin Hooper this season with the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, my bold prediction here is that Austin Hooper winds up as a top five tight end by the end of the season. I'm not going to say he's going to enter that top tier with George Kittle, Zach Ertz, and Travis Kelsey, because I don't think really anyone outside of maybe Hunter Henry or O.J. Howard has that chance. But Austin Hooper has a chance to be a top five tight end. And I think that this kind of stems from my process at tight end, where I want to target tight ends who are in good offenses and will score touchdowns. And Austin Hooper fits within both those. This all, that Atlanta Falcons defense or offense was good last year, but we didn't notice because their defense was so bad that their offense just did not matter. Now they enter the offseason, they pick up a couple of good offensive linemen in free agency, add two more in the first round of the draft, and I would expect a, a, an offense that was already good last year to get even better. And the positive for Austin Hooper is they did not add to their, their pass catchers. Sure, you get another year of Calvin Ridley, maybe he progresses and takes up more targets, but it's not as if they bought another wide receiver in free agency. So it's back at the same group. Last year, Hooper's target market share was 15% with 18% of the red zone targets. And if he keeps those numbers up in an offense that should be better and should generate more scoring drives this year, he does have a path towards being a top five tight end. Now, again, I'm not going to, you know, go out of my way to reach for Austin Hooper because I think that there are a lot of other tight ends in this exact same tier who are very attractive. But if Austin Hooper's on the board for me, you know, where he's going and I still don't have a tight end, I'm going to take him every time because I think that the upside in this offense is really fun. I want exposure to Atlanta. I think they're a really good team. I think that they could make some damage this year given their new pieces on the offensive line. So Austin Hooper is a guy I think could take a step forward this year, and I want to buy in before that happens. The Atlanta Falcons play something like 13 of their 16 games inside of a dome this year, so there's a lot to like with their offense. Jim Sonis is buying Austin Hooper if you wait on tight end in your fantasy football drafts.
For Jim Sonis, I am Frank Stanfield. Thank you so much for watching. Good luck in your drafts this weekend, and we'll see you next week.